We would rather be an usher at the door than spend time in prayer. We'd rather play the, play the piano in church than pray. We'd rather work in the hospitality department or work in the nursery than spend time in prayer. In other words, we would want any other activity except, please don't tell us to pray. We kind of place prayer as the thing we do once in a while when somebody makes us feel guilty about it. But I hope that you will find out that prayer is not an option anymore. And you'll see it as your most important work. Why don't people pray? Here's my answer. Because of results. They don't get results. I was brought up in a religious environment just like you. And I always question this. Why is it that on Sunday mornings, for those of you who worship on Sundays, the church building is packed with people. And if you are a Sabbath worshiper on Saturday mornings, the church building is filled with people. And if you are a Muslim, you would find that during the worship times, everybody's in the mosque. But there's a problem, I notice. During the prayer meeting night, everybody gone. And the only people that attend the prayer meeting are some old women who ain't got nothing to do. We call them intercessors. What we really call, what we really mean by that is those who pray because we don't pray. That's an intercessor to you. Those who pray because we ain't got time to do it. The prayer meeting is always the smallest meeting in every church. Check it out. I mean, to have this many people in a prayer meeting right here, this is somebody's entire church. And I've gone and I've been in churches in my life where they had a lot of people on Sunday morning and prayer meeting is like 10 people. Question, why? The answer, because people don't get results. I think I'm just like you. If you keep doing something and it ain't working, you stop doing it. That's logical, eh? It's like going to a soda machine and putting in your quarters and hitting the bar and nothing comes out. You put some more quarters in, hit the bar, nothing comes out. Now after four or five dollars, hopefully by then you figure out, I better leave this machine alone. Well, that's the way prayer is for most people. They pray, they've gone to prayer meeting. Sometimes, you know, you're a young Christian. You can't wait to get to prayer meeting. You're excited. And then you, finally you figure out why the other folks ain't there. Because you ain't getting no answers to prayer. These old people praying, ain't nothing working. You ain't getting no responses. You don't see any evidence. There's no, there's no kind of re response to, from God. So you begin to say, this ain't working. And so you quit. That's why people don't pray. Because they don't get answers. But here is what I call the prayer principle. When you study the word of God carefully and God's action in history, you will come to a conclusion that John Wesley came to years ago. I thought he did a great job in expressing it. I understood it myself, but John Wesley said this. He said, it seems that without God, man cannot do anything on earth but without man God will not do anything on earth beautiful statement without God man cannot and without man God will not there's some things God wants to be done on earth for his kingdom he wants his kingdom to come on earth but he cannot do it without man and man cannot do it without God. In other words, prayer is really a partnership between the divine and mankind. God needs you, and you need God. The point is, what happens on earth doesn't really depend on God. It depends on you. When I learned this, I became a prayer meeting 
walking on two legs every minute. I pray all the time. I don't go to prayer meetings. I am a prayer meeting. Anybody who hung around me will hear me praying all the time. Some of them I just say, Jesus is Lord. I'm praying. Jesus is Lord. I'm calling his ownership in my environment all the time. Why? Because God can do nothing on earth without a human giving him release. Let me quote a scripture that proves this. Jesus said, wherever any two of you shall touch and agree concerning anything on the earth, then it shall be done by your Father who is in heaven. Simple statement, profound implications. He's telling us that heaven wants to do a lot of things on earth, but heaven is waiting for at least two humans to get together and touch in faith and agree in prayer on something on the earth. Then God has permission to do it from heaven. So earth depends on heaven to get things done, but heaven depends on earth for permission to do it. So without you, God will not. That leads me to point number three. Prayer is really earthly license for heavenly interference. What is prayer? Think about what it means. Prayer is man giving God license to interfere in earth's affairs through man's agency of faith. God cannot do in earth what you don't believe he can do. Christ says, according to your belief, be it unto you. So what happens here depends on what we believe God can do. Many times when God meant humans, he would tell them what he wanted to do. And then he would say this, do you believe I can do this? The word believe is the word pistis in Greek. It's the word we translate as faith. According to your faith, I can do it. One time the Bible says Jesus Christ went to his own hometown, Nazareth. But he couldn't do any miracles there because the people did not believe him. Now, can you imagine all the power of the universe was in a body walking in your village and can't heal you because you won't believe? What man does can block God or release God. For the next three weeks, you are going to become what I call a bigger and bigger and bigger pipe for God to flow through. Something good is going to happen on earth in the next three weeks. But if we don't meet, to agree, God can't release what he wants to do in the earth. So we give him license. That leads me to point number four. Write this down. Prayer is not an option, therefore, it's a necessity. Necessity means God depends on you to petition him so he could get something done that he always wanted to do in the earth. And this is why most of the time when you talk about prayer in the Bible, if you read a verse in the Bible concerning prayer, it begins with a letter, with a, with a word, with two letters. If. Most of the scriptures con concerning prayer begins with that word. If. Because it's a condition. There's a verse that religious people always quote when they want God to do something in their country. What's that verse? If my people. See, it starts with an if. But they don't read the whole verse properly. <laughs> like turning from your wicked ways, no more sweethearting. See, you know, they want God to heal the lamb, but they don't want to deal with the other conditions, see? Yeah. Always a condition. It is necessary for us to pray for God to do what he wants. And this is why 
when we talk about the keys of the kingdom, I want to read the words of Jesus himself, the king. Write these words down, please. In Matthew 6, verse 5, Christ, at the beginning of his ministry, laid down this priority. He said, and when you pray. That's enough for me right there. Everybody say together. And when you pray. He didn't say, if you pray. If I say to you, and when you come, you can get such and such a thing from my house. What am I saying? I even ain't asking whether you're coming, hey. You are coming. You're certain to come. Look at his words. He didn't say, if you find time in your busy schedule. He takes it for granted that you got this covered. And when you pray, he expects it. Everybody knows it, but we don't do it. And so we always relegate prayer to a small group of people who we say are intercessors. Now, an intercessor in the minds of religious churches is what I call professional prayers. <laughs> These are people who we have appointed, so to speak. Matter of fact, some of them are self-appointed. But we kind of have this group of people who are the ones who do what we should be doing but don't do. And we use them to substitute for us. No one can do that. I can pray for you, but I can never substitute for you for praying. Here's something to remember. I was shocked when I discovered this. I was 17 years old. I was on a fast. And the Lord said this to me. There's no such thing in the Bible as an intercessory ministry. I started rebuking God. I said, my mother's an intercessor. <laughs> my mother prayed all the time. God said, yeah, but that ain't no ministry. There's no gift of intercession in the Bible. Find it. Doesn't exist. There's no gift of prayer in the Bible. It's gift of tongues, gift of miracles, but no gift of prayer. Do you know why? Because it ain't a gift. Everyone's supposed to do it. But we love intercessors because they take care of what we are guilty of. We, and we say to them, you pray for us. We're going to go and watch TV. So during prayer meeting evening, everybody is home drinking their switcher and watching television while a few old folks who ain't got nothing to do are praying. This is not God's will. Jesus said, men everywhere ought always to pray. All men everywhere, he says. Not a few chosen specialists. Prayer is not a ministry for the few. It's a necessity for the all. I don't get me wrong. People should pray for you. And I thank God that people pray for me all the time. I got people who intercede for me. and Boy, I thank God for that. But they should never, I should never think that they can replace my praying for myself. I hope this fast will change your attitude toward your prayer life. Prayer is a necessity. I want to put this up here for you to remember this, because some of you all got books on prayer in your house. Prayer books are like cooking books, cookbooks. How many of you got cookbooks in your house? Let me see your hand. All cookbooks, let me see your hand. You got cookbooks in your house. Come on, wave high. Be honest. God looking to be, tell the truth. Okay. Do you all use them? Don't you lie. You don't, you don't use them cookbooks. <laughs> Once in a while, you might want to find one, how to make one cookie or something. Now, those cookbooks been in your house for 10 years. And in those books, 
are powerful recipes to produce beautiful products of food but you don't use them in other words having a recipe and baking a cake is two different things studying prayer and praying is different having a good book by Finney in your house is nice but are you praying Finney prayed <laughs> Charles Finney prayed Oswald Chambers powerful books on prayer he prayed you don't put this book on your coffee table so folks can see your beautiful prayer book and they think you are spiritual <laughs> prayer books are for praying you learn how to pray the book I wrote on prayer is from my life that's why people quote me I write from my experience I write from what God did for me because it has to be something that worked for me before I tell you it can happen don't just study prayer pray don't just read about prayer pray don't listen to other people's stories about prayer pray That's what he expects. What is prayer? We'll deal with this a little later in detail, but I want to give you the definition before we go. The word prayer is the word petition. And the word petition means a legal appeal or demand on a government based on constitutional right protected by law complicated but please write it down prayer is petition petition is a legal appeal or a demand that you place on a governmental authority and that demand is based on a constitutional right and the right is protected by law. That's what prayer is. That's what the word means in scripture. If you look at that statement, right away you can tell that you can't beg. Prayer is not begging for anything. Prayer is more of an appeal or a demand based on legal rights. God, in the next three weeks, don't want you hanging around his throne begging for nothing. He want to do business with you. He has some things to do on earth. And you are now positioning yourself in a consecration so that he can finally find a channel to get it through. You're going to learn that fasting is interesting. Fasting... <laughs> I remember when I began to learn to fast. I learned to fast from my mother and father. But my mother especially, she had some books around the house written by men like Shambach and A.A. A. Allen. And all Roberts. And I kept thinking, these men got so much spiritual power. I want that power. And they used to say, you got to pay a price. And I began to study it. And then I began to do it as a teenager. And my life turned upside down when I had my first fast, seven days. That's when I wrote a song. The song is called Living with Jesus on the Other Side. I wrote that on a fast. And I began to understand that fasting was like a plunger. <laughs> it was like Drano for a human life. And I discovered that food is like rust in a pipe, clogging up the hole. And the more you eat, the smaller the hole in the pipe until you 
become so clogged up that God can't get nothing through you. Got the picture? And some of you are that way right now. You've eaten so much the last eight months that you, you, you yourself can't get nothing through you. <laughs> Am I right about it? You are so physically clogged up that mentally you can't even think straight. Your mentality is affected. Your health has been slowed down. You get tired climbing steps. Imagine spiritual clog. And fasting is the only way to flush that stuff out. Your flesh is your greatest blessing and curse. It's a blessing because you need it to live on earth. It's a curse because it can become your ruler. Fasting puts your body back where it belongs. Under your spirit. Fasting takes your body and submits it to the spirit. Well, let's be honest. Sometimes you don't want to eat, right? Spiritually. You tell God, I, I'm going to fast today. But your body begins to whoop you. As a matter of fact, that's the same day they decide to have a party in the office with chicken and macaroni and peas and rice. <laughs> and all of a sudden, your body grabs your spirit, body slams it, stands over it and says, we're going to eat today. And all the people in the saints say, amen. You surrender to your dirt body. Fasting grabs that, puts it back in order. Prayer is you petitioning God based on your rights as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, we'll deal with this in details during this fast, how this works. You're going to see some scriptures you never saw before in your life. I'm going to show you some thoughts from the Bible that are going to change the way you were taught all your life about prayer and fasting. Ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about the effects of fasting. I like this one. What happens when you fast? First of all, fasting changes you. Now, why did I say that? Because number two is a contradiction. Fasting does not change God. God never changes. Ain't nothing wrong with God. God ain't clogged up. <laughs> the clogging got to be on the other side. Fasting doesn't change God. It doesn't move God. It moves God. And changes you. The best way to describe God and your life in a fast is before you fast or live a fasted life, it's almost like a big tank with 50,000 gallons of water in it. And a little pipe is hooked up to it, a small little two inch pipe to this big tank. The amount of water that's available is 50,000 gallons. But the amount that can flow through your little pipe is one-tenth of a gallon. The amount that's available doesn't change. But the amount that flows out through the pipe depends on the size of the pipe. God is always 50,000 gallons ready to do some stuff, but he can't find pipes to hook up big enough. And most of the pipes hook up to them, they all clog up with sin, food, grits. <laughs> and peas. Grits and peas, Jesus help me. With salt beef in it. Ooh, I feel that noise right there. 
<laughs> this is your last go round. You better enjoy it now. <laughs> God is ready to work anytime, but he, he keeps running into these pipes that are so small, clogged up. And they're making plenty of noise, you know. <laughs> they're shouting, claiming, confessing. God said, but you clogged up. The Lord can do anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I can't have nothing but this little, this little hole you got. You ain't got a fasted life. Fasting is the most important aspect of prayer. It doesn't move God. Number three, fasting increases your spiritual capacity. It's like going back to the tank, removing the two-inch pipe, and putting a 15-inch pipe to it. <laughs> now more water can flow. God says, look, I need to find some people who will increase their capacity to handle my flow. Let me tell you something. Okay. Let's, I'm going to read the scripture, quote the scripture again. We love the scripture, okay? When there's crime in a country, economic chaos, social decay, immorality in a country, what do we do? Let's call a prayer meeting, we say. So all the bishops get together, and we get in the park, and all the saints come along with their bellies full of grits. <laughs> the bishop belly bigger than anybody else's belly. But oh, watch this now. And they come to pray for what? A nation. Watch this, a nation. Now, you know how big a nation is? Do you know how complicated a nation is? Do you know how complicated crime is and broken homes and, and abuse? These are big problems. And you come to God with a small little pipe. I want you to heal the nation, please. God said, the stuff I need to heal your nation, that pipe ain't going to work. So what's God? If my people who claim to be called by my name if they what okay write the word humble down the word humble in my book I talk about this the word humble to humble means to fast the translation in the English was not a good translation it means to humble it means to fast and pray you want God to heal a big problem? He need a big pipe. The demon that was in that boy must have been a legion. Because they prayed for that little boy, remember? They, they prayed all afternoon and the demon wouldn't come out. And when Christ came down from the mountain, it came out in seconds. Question, what was he doing in the mountain? Well, read the verse before. It says, he went aside alone to pray and to fast. When he came down, no food. Fellas down there full of fish. <laughs> come out, come out. Demon said, Yo, the, your pipe too small. I ain't coming out of this, brother. And the Bible says, Jesus just said, out. <laughs> Demon <laughs> left. The disciples prayed the same prayer. Jesus prayed. Different results. And they were ashamed, the Bible says. Because all the people saw that. And the next morning they were at a meal. And they were all quiet. I don't blame them. They were sitting in the room, everybody eating like they spiritual. <laughs> they were all thinking, he just embarrassed us before all them people. And one of them built the courage. And Peter said, Lord, why couldn't we cast that demon out yesterday? Christ says, well, this kind doesn't come out just by prayer. This needs a big capacity. If you are trying to figure out something right now in your life, for the last six months, maybe a year, maybe two years, you've been trying to work on something, and it seems as if it just wouldn't break. I'm giving you the biggest secret now. 
If you know you're supposed to have it, if you know it's God's will and the promise in the word, if you know this is God's legal right for you, if you know you're supposed to have it, then you're supposed to break that thing. And you break it by fasting. This is going to be the best three weeks you ever spent in your life. Things that were held up for three years are going to come out in three weeks. When God has a capacity big enough, he, when he begins to flow, every demon that was holding back will be swept away by the power of God flowing through a fasted life. Are you ready to fast? Say yes. Fasting is the most powerful force in prayer. It widens your pipe. It cleans out all the dirt. It wipes out all the refuse. It takes away every hindrance that was holding you back. That's why the devil loves you to eat. Especially when you set your face to fast. That's when they want to take you out for lunch for your birthday and pay for it. I'm telling you, you watch the next three weeks, I'm telling you, every demonic influence will show up. Promise me. But you remember what I said tonight. Just tell that temptation, I know why you came. And you ain't going to win. Because I'm going to clean this pipe out in the next three weeks.